Hi everyone, Jonathan here. Welcome back to another suspicious box on the table. We've had a few of these of late. Um, there's a reason for it. Yes, more dueling pistols. Uh, yet again, I do my scare quotes because um, if, you, if you haven't seen our previous video on dueling pistols, the short version is dueling pistols are a thing. It's not that dueling pistols didn't exist. Uh, it's more that, well, there's an excellent article which I reference in that video from Professor David Weaver in the Journal of the Arms and Armour Society that you should definitely check out if you're interested in, well, this period, never mind dueling pistols. But it's more, it's more of a nuanced thing and it's to do with form or function. So the traditional narrative is that dueling pistols develop driven by function, to do with quickly coming into the aim, um, very light trigger, very fast acting locks, all that kind of thing. Well, um, David has argued, I think convincingly, that basically all the, all the features of a dueling pistol are just useful features for a pistol, and it's much more of a stylistic thing. The switch from the, new, the uh, Rococo style holster pistol to the neoclassical style dueling pistol, and it's only from 1785 that we get the term dueling pistol actually used, or at least written down as far as we know. So from 1785 onwards, dueling pistols are a thing, but here's where a slightly tortured analogy might help. I think of this a bit like sports utility vehicle. You don't necessarily, in fact, you almost certainly don't go out to buy an SUV because you want to go and carve up some mud off-road. You buy it because it's the current fashion of car. That's my take for what it's worth on the reality of the dueling pistol. However, there's a very important caveat to that. Uh, well, firstly, if we happen to know that somebody had purchased uh, pistols with an eye to dueling with them, rather than self-defense, rather than target shooting, um, or, or any other purpose you might think of, obviously that would be evidence for a, a, a dueling style pistols that were definitely used for dueling or intended to be used for dueling. It, there are, I think, a couple of provenance sets out there that we know belong to someone who actually fought a duel, which is the ultimate in dueling pistols. And then there is a technical feature that really does tell you this person, at the very least, wanted, or <laughs> wanted to be prepared to fight a duel. And that is hidden rifling, or secret rifling. And I mentioned it last time, and I said at the time I had never seen, I think I, I refer to it as scratch rifling, um, not that I doubted W.W. W. W. Greener, who wrote the book The Gun, the very aptly named book, The Gun. Um, 1835, or that edition, he actually mentions scratch rifling, and he mentions it as being very much a thing that uh, the Mantons, John and Joseph Manton, were known for, so a couple of decades before, or maybe a bit less than that. Uh, but he mentions it as a thing that was done in the past to conceal rifling, because the rules of dueling said you couldn't use rifling, but if you wanted to live, you might want to use the rifling, have the rifling in the gun, so you would conceal it. Now, two ways of doing that. One is the scratch rifling that Greener mentions, and apparently the Mantons did do that. I've still yet to see scratch rifling myself, but that's just because our pistols don't have it. Um, anyone does have, if anyone does have pictures or, or a gun, um, let me know, I'd love to see it. And the way it's described is lots, or paraphrasing, lots of very fine and shallow grooves. So very narrow lands and grooves and very, very shallow. Greener describes it as being the thickness of a piece of paper. Now he means very heavy gauge to us, uh, rag based sort of writing paper or cartridge paper, um, but still incredibly shallow and a heck of a lot of them to try to make up for what little purchase they would have on the ball as it spins um, down the barrel. We do actually have some cast lead balls from this set, which I'm coming to here. Um, I mean, they're not remarkable in any way, but standard round balls. And then with a patch of some sort, and it's the patch that is biting into those tiny rifling grooves and getting spun. Um, or you could size the ball to those those grooves so they are uh, the lead is actually bearing into the grooves depending on how you want to do it so that's scratch rifling still haven't seen it 
I'm sure it exists. I'm sure there are pistols out there. Um, Atkinson, in his dueling book, mentions them uh, as being out there. I've seen them listed in auction catalogues. I just haven't seen them yet. What I have now seen, thanks to gunmaker Stephen Gladhill, who used to work here at the Armouries um, some years ago, he contacted me, and he has a pair of Manton dueling pistols. Mantons? But they're not scratch rifle. They are uh, what's <laughs> termed in the literature, or period literature, French rifling, which I think is a a very English euphemistic use of the word French. Um, you can probably think of at least one other um, for something that's underhand and not the done thing, because this, of course, would be very underhand. You are ostensibly bringing a smoothbore pistol, but you're actually bringing a rifle pistol that has every chance of um, shooting. Uh, well, in theory, <laughs> uh, some are not convinced that, uh, that this um, hidden rifling was actually that effective, but let's assume it was you are, and even if it wasn't, you think you are gaining an unfair advantage. It's pretty naughty. Anyway, the other type, this French rifling, Stephen inspired me to go and check all the pistols that aren't on display. So actually, I need to go back at some point and dig them all out of display and check them for either scratch or French rifling. So what do we mean by French rifling? Well, we'll have a, I'll just give you a summary of these in a moment, but we'll cut straight to the chase as I've rambled on enough already with what the French rifling is, because it's beautifully shown here. And it is ordinary rifling, pretty much ordinary rifling, relatively shallow by some standards. And the lands, the bits that stick up, are rounded. They're not crisply sharp. So it's, it's almost like hand sort of uh, homemade rifling I've seen on uh, craft-produced firearms where, where people haven't got access to proper machinery and they've taken it quite shallow and it ends up quite indistinct. Now, I think that's deliberate in this case. Makers like, and this is Mortimer, um, Harvey Walk Lake, Walk Late Mortimer Jr., this would be, operating until 1822 in London. Um, makers like that, I mean, these are, these are not absolutely clean for display, so they're not shining like they would have when they were new, but they are high quality pieces. They're not going to make substandard hand cut rifling unless they mean to. And I think that's because French rifling is where you've got maybe an inch of smooth bore, as you've hopefully can see if we drop a light down the bore. So as you would have seen, you, you can see nothing at the muzzle. This looks absolutely smooth bore, feels absolutely smooth bore. But then we light this up and we reveal hidden rifling. And the, the hidden or the French rifling runs for most of the bore as well. So the bullet's getting a good old twist going on there. Um, now, some will say that the, if you're going to just rifle part of the barrel, you should do it right at the end. Well, that would defeat the object. The whole point here is that your opponent cannot detect that he is um, getting shot at by a rifled pistol. Now, of course, if you're operating under rules that say you shoot from the same pair of pistols, that's a problem. Although, well, you're giving yourself an advantage, but you're also leveling the playing field and increasing the chance of you getting shot. So you definitely don't want to fight under... Um... Now, these, these rules were, were somewhat arbitrary, but there are written, uh, written rules, and you would agree the specific rules for each uh, encounter. So you would want to try and engineer a situation where you didn't get shot at by your own pistol because it's too accurate. So this is incredibly exciting for me because um, I, having, having casually looked at all of our pistols in storage previously, I had missed this. Now, you can say that's me being inept, um, or you can say that this is actually a very clever system. Now, with gloves on, they're, they're very thin gloves. These are designed, rather than those cotton ones we, we used to wear, uh, that you can still have some sense of touch, so it's less, you're less likely to drop stuff, break stuff. That's the whole idea of these. So, and I can feel the grooves, but if I, if I was just thinking, hmm, I've heard of this secret rifling thing, I'm just gonna, you mind if I just... Now, of course, if you do that in front of this other gentleman, he might bluster and say, how dare you call me into, call my, my honor into question, we're gonna fight another duel after this one, and it just goes on forever. Um, so I don't know how that would actually pan out, but in theory, if you did catch a sneaky uh, check, it's possible you'd miss it. If you didn't know about secret rifling, and you just went, mm, I don't trust this chap, uh, yeah, well, there's nothing there, all good. Actually, there it is inside. 
probably doing its job. So um, I will double check at some point <laughs> uh, our pistols on display, especially the Mantons, to see if we have any scratch, so-called scratch rifling as well. Um, the pistols themselves, uh, they are they're percussion, as you can see. So they have those dolphin slash sea monster hammers that we've seen quite recently, actually. Um, this, this little guy looks like he's got little fangs, almost, so maybe not a dolphin. Not seen too many vampire dolphins um, in the oceans. They're early percussion pistols. As I say, um, H.W. Mortimer and Son were only operating at this address, which is pleasingly on the trigger guard here, 89 Fleet Street, London. They are only listed there until 1822 which gives us a fairly hard date for this because percussion caps of this nature that would have fitted this system, the classic, possibly Joseph Egg, possibly um, the Frenchman Prella invented, are only around from about 18... Well, 1818 is when they're invented. They're only really available commercially about 1820. So this is the cutting edge of, and we know it's bought for duelling, the duelling pistol for 18. 22 ish thanks so much for watching guys um, as always you can come and visit one of our three museums here in the uk but if you can't do that we have our digital options we have facebook twitter and instagram that you can check out uh, worth keeping an eye out for any upcoming events on there and you can still donate to us if you'd be so kind as to do that we will have a link in the description um, but whatever you do we really appreciate you watching and we'll see you again next week